Now, though, it was, well, triumphant trials, new arrivals, and last night's I'm a Celebrity. Here we go. Look at that, that, she's rapid. Oh, yeah, these bugs. Oh, God, my boots. Go on. Yes. yes. Three minutes gone, Jamie Lynn. Cockroaches in there. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we got ten stars. Yeah. Yeah. I've never started something and finished it. It's always quit. I'm Frankie Dittori. I'm a professional jockey. I'm Tony Bellew. I am known for punching people in the face. This is my biggest challenge. Well, joining me now, live from Australia, there he is, Richard Arnold. Oh, Richard, it's great to talk to you. It's been too long that you were on here. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I know. How are you doing, my luxury item, you? I am absolutely <laughs> fine. And it's so interesting, isn't it? When two new campmates go in, it can change the dynamics completely. It certainly does, my love. It, it stokes the coals of that campfire and then some. And we've got two new alpha males coming in, as you flagged there, uh, Lorraine. We've got uh, the boxer, Tony Ballou, and, of course, uh, jockey Frankie Dettori. Uh, sporting legends in their own rights. Um, they are going to be camp coaches, we're told, leading the teams. They'll be split in half two teams into the Scarina. So who knows what we can expect in tonight's episode. Uh, that was teased last night on the show. But for me personally, Lorraine, and I'm sure for you as a fan of the show as well, having, as I say, those alpha males uh, lock horns in the jungle camp mm. with the resident commander-in-chief, Nigel Farage, will be television gold. Now, Nigel Farage apparently does know Frankie Dettori. Frankie's admitted, because oh. he's not really in the showbiz orbit, that um, he knows Nigel because they share the same management, or at least shared the same management team. But it'll be interesting to see how they bond, or perhaps not, under pressure when they get under the jungle canopy. It's definitely going to be one to watch. For sure, absolutely. I mean, there's been loads, loads going on. But also, I thought, you know, Jamie Lynn, she looked a bit as if she didn't really want to be oh. there. But she did so well in that trial. Her confidence will be boosted, won't it? I was screaming at the screen watching it at Lorraine this morning on the link that we get given. You've got Jamie Lynn scaling the heights of this uh, gantry, this scaffolding, the climb of cruelty, facing all the, uh, the jitters and the critters that anyone can expect when they go into camp. She got 10 stars and the hugs she got, the reception she got when she got back to the camp. And as Antidex said last night, it was a, a real arc, a real uh, 180, if you like, a story of redemption. So hopefully that will give her the confidence to stay. No, exactly. But Nella was talking about leaving, wasn't she? She was talking about just going. Yeah. Yeah, and she bloomed so brightly in the beginning. And, of course, she's still a thorn in Fred's side. Um, a camp divided still. They have locked horns and they are not speaking at all. And she talked to Grace Dent, her fellow campmate, last night about quitting, saying that she's... Um, got a habit of doing that in her life. She always quits gigs before she actually finishes the job, if you like, be it emotionally or professionally. So it'll be interesting to see if, now that Jamie Lynn has had her own story of redemption, uh -huh. if uh, Nella Rose doesn't follow that same pattern, because unfortunately she slumped in the bookies' odds, but maybe that will change overnight after she gave us more of an insight into uh, the complexities of her character, because she definitely wears her emotions very close to the surface, and, and she's clearly had many issues that she's had to work through in her life. So I'd like to see see Nella stay and I don't think I'm alone in that. No, 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 absolutely. Thank you, Richard. So, so good to talk to you. And um, we're going to stick with Nella because actually there was a clash when um, she and Nigel Farage discussed immigration. Since 2000, mm -hmm. the British population mm -hmm. has increased by 10 million. Mm -hmm. 10 million. Yeah, we're good growing. Thing. Right? Good thing, unless you want a GP appointment. Right. Good thing, okay, unless you want your so kid. I'm, I'm stopping I you from getting a GP appointment. You're not getting an appointment. You're not getting an appointment because the NHS is lacking funding. I know. Most of your doctors are Asian, right? Which, which is which well, is most of wrong. your nurses are African women, right? But don't you understand what I'm saying? You want us gone. Well, join me now is our Dr Amir, along with ITV News UK editor Paul Brands. Um, Amir, I know you were listening to that. You're at the front line. You're a GP, of course. What did you What did you make of that when he says, oh, you know, we're swamped and you can't get an appointment with your GP? I know it's something we have talked about a lot. Yeah, 
Morning, Lorraine. I think talking about immigration is important. And as long as it's balanced and civilised, I think when it becomes problematic is when inflammatory language is, is used and it creates a them and us right. situation. And in the past, that has generally been the case. I can talk as someone as, as a child of immigrants, uh, that, that some of the language that's been used in the debate around immigration has made me feel very uncomfortable and at times unsafe. Nigel Farage in that clip suggests that immigration is part of the reason why people can't get an appointment with their GP. And as a frontline GP and an NHS doctor of 20 years, I can tell you that isn't isn't true. The facts and figures don't speak to that. In fact, immigration uh, and immigrants and their descendants are part of the reason you can get an appointment with your GP. Looking at facts and figures from NHS websites and the government website, actually 19% uh, of the NHS workforce is made up of people who have come to this country from abroad. And if you widen that out to their descendants, so immigrants and their descendants, it increases to 25%. But if you're looking at the medical workforce of the NHS, so that's the doctors, nurses and other clinicians, that number increases to 42% of the NHS workforce. So we are part of the reason you can see your GP. We are part of the reason you can get an X-ray and an ultrasound scan or see that specialist at the, at the hospital. Uh, and we're, we're tired, really, Lorraine, of you know, being this punching back of this political football used to divide the nation. And the other thing I'm tired of, Lorraine, if I'm being perfectly honest, is having to justify my existence by the worth I bring to this country and my parents as well. It's really difficult, particularly, you know, given in the historical context of Britain's colonial past. If you're only looking at immigration right now and not looking at why it's happened over the years, you're really missing a massive piece of that puzzle. Amir, thank you for putting that into context. I appreciate it very much. Um, Nigel Farage last night also talked about whether he would run for Prime Minister. Would you ever want to run? As generous. I don't know. Minister. We'll see. Depends how much mess the country gets in. Really? <laughs> I don't, honestly don't know. I mean, it's not an easy job. As for little me, there's a lot of speculation that after they lose the next election, oh, you know, maybe Nigel becomes leader of the Tory party one day. So there's a lot of chatter about it. Uh, whether it's going to happen, I've no idea. Important thing, though, is to say this. Never say never. So he's not saying no, Paul. Mm, he's, he's not, not saying, saying no, no at all. I mean, that is a classic politician's <laughs> answer that basically <laughs> means yes. He would yeah, love to be Prime Minister. He's just waiting for the right opportunity right. to emerge. And that's why, actually, last night's debate about immigration, which Dr Amir spoke so personally about this morning, is key, really, to the whole arc around Nigel Farage's own story. Sure. Because he is looking for that opportunity to come back into politics. And there are debates happening within the Conservative Party about who their next leader might be, assuming mm. Rishi Sunak does lose the next election. Could Nigel Farage be admitted into the Conservative Party? Many Conservative members would like him to be. Then he could rise to the top and potentially become Prime Minister. And, you know, as I say, he definitely wants yeah. to be, doesn't he? Oh, <clears> of course. <throat> of course. Of course he does. It's always a risk, isn't it, for a politician? And, of course, we should say he's not a serving politician. It's not the same as Matt Hancock last year and Nadine Dorries. But... You know, there is a risk there, um, and it's a calculated one. And so far, he really is playing the game. He really is. You know, he's got his agenda and he's sticking to it. Yeah, and again, it's timing, I think, is interesting with all of this. So mm. immigration is really high on the political agenda at the moment. In fact, in about 21 minutes' time, we'll get the net migration figures, which are, are regularly in the news. They come out uh, a couple of times a year, and the government, uh, every time they come out, has a massive debate and, and, and is, is questioned about why net migration is particularly high, because the government keeps promising to bring it down and keep failing to, keeps failing to bring it down. So the timing of this is, is perfect, really, for mm. Nigel Farage, especially mm. when we had that Rwanda judgment last week as well. Indeed. Remember, which yes. is about a different type of migration, of course. what the government calls illegal migration, but still. So, you know, it's a really hot topic at the moment. He's in there, he's talking about it on national TV in front mm. of millions of people, right at the moment when Rishi Sunak is struggling, and as I say, the Conservative Party is looking around for who might be the next leader. Gosh, it's fascinating. You, you, you couldn't make it up, some of it. And there is this thing about the fact that, you know, there, there was rumours yesterday about there might be a general election sooner than we think. Mm. So it could be, you know, they could be actually starting to campaign as soon as the start of next year, which is no distance at all. Yeah, so the autumn statement had a few mm. clues in it, essentially, with those tax cuts, national insurance cuts, uh, coming in in January, so that gives everyone a little bit of boost going into the new year, puts people in a good mood, in theory. Yeah. Uh, people think, oh, the Conservative government's cutting my taxes. Then in March, we have a budget, 
So another opportunity to cut taxes, which then you could see the government using as momentum into maybe a, a May election, mm. uh, rather than waiting until the autumn or the winter of next year, which is as long as they could go if they wanted to. Sure. Um, and the other big clue in yesterday's autumn statement was that growth isn't going to be great next year. Partly actually, Lorraine, because immigration uh, isn't as high as it used to be when we were in the EU. I mean, you can argue that it is still particularly high, but... Uh, lots of industries have shortages at the moment. They yes. can't recruit enough people, partly because immigration has fallen. So growth isn't great at the moment in the economy. So again, the government, there's no point in them waiting much longer because it's not yeah. going to be particularly rosier by the end of next year. Fascinating. Fa we live in interesting times. We do. <laughs> thank you. And Amir, thank you as well. We'll talk to you later.